Um, I'm going to take a page out of Karen's book from last week, and she just invited someone to come up and read the scriptures. Would anyone be willing to do that? It's 10 verses. Excellent. John chapter 10. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, perfect. Sorry, my Bible print is very small. Check. John 10, verses 1 to 10. John 10, 1 to 10. The shepherd and his flock. I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Steve. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open these scriptures, as we engage these scriptures, may the Holy Spirit open our hearts. May the promises of our good shepherd be made new in our lives. We ask you to help us hear your voice, to hear you call our names, and invite us to deeper trust and life to the full in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So what is it about voices? What is it about voices? When we listen to music in the car as a family, uh, my kids can tell you that I love voices with something called vocal fry. Is anyone familiar with vocal fry? It's, it's, it's whether it's this natural raspiness or a vocal fry from maybe too many like cigarettes or something. Uh, I love how those voices sing. There's actually an episode of Friends, if you're familiar with that show, where Phoebe Buffay intentionally tries to get sick because she wants to get her, what she calls a sexy voice, right? That's what vocal fry is. Vocal fry is that like, you know, that raspiness. I love it. And then there's something about different kind of voices, right? Something about the register of their voice or the cadence of their voice. James Earl Jones, I can't even do it. It's so, so deep. Um, but you're captivated by everything they say because of their voice. Is anyone familiar with David Attenborough? He's a guy that does like the planet Earth things. Right? That guy can talk about anything, right? He can talk about anything. He's like, ah, oh, yes, the male peacock. Look at those feathers. He's, he's fanning them out. <laughs> yeah. The, the male is confident and it's working, right? His voice is the best. And then 45 minutes later, I've watched a, a, an hour-long documentary on birds, right? Uh, when a particular voice speaks to you, it resonates, right? Your heart kind of comes alive. Uh, remember when the disciples were discovered that it was Jesus talking to them on the road to Emmaus? Do you remember what they said? They said, were not our hearts burning within us? Were not our hearts burning within us? When he was talking with us on the road, their hearts were burning. They didn't know it was Jesus, but they were like, in retrospect, they're like, that was Jesus. That was Jesus. See, because Christi Christianity is not just ideas. It's not just philosophy. It's intensely relational. It's a connection with someone, right? We can all, they say worship, it's been said like worship's not about us. And in some sense, that's true, right? Worship is about glorifying God. But because it's about relationship, worship has everything to do with us, doesn't it? It's a connection with God. It's a connection with his voice. The disciples of Jesus, do you remember, they would sit at his feet. They would sit at the rabbi's feet. They would soak in his voice and his teaching. Remember Mary at the resurrection. Do you remember how she recognized Jesus? His voice. His voice. They were so, I have goosebumps. 
They, they're, so, they're such a connection with his voice and what Jesus taught and the life that he bring them. That she's like, this is Jesus. My heart is burning within me. You and I are invited to hear God's voice like that. You and I are invited to hear God's voice through prayer, through listening, through reading the scripture, through brothers and sisters, through worship, right? The way that this congregation was passionately singing those songs, we're all going to have vocal fry. We're all going to have that Phoebe voice. <laughs> um, the, when we face challenging circumstances in our lives, what's the language we often use? We often say there's voices in my mind. There's voices that pull me. There's voices that tempt me. Don't we use that language? There's voices that fight for my attention. There's voices that are trying to devour me. And it's the conviction of followers of Jesus that we can discern Jesus's voice amidst all of that, right? We can discern God's voice in the midst of the chorus, even if the chorus is trying to tear us apart. We can learn to hear Jesus's voice. So before we get into this text, as a general principle, it's always appropriate to look at the historical context of the passage that we find ourselves in. Because Jesus' audience, the people he's speaking to, they've been shaped over time. They've been shaped by the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. Right? When Jesus talks about shepherds and sheep, his audience would have had an idea of what that meant. Right? His audience would have heard language from the Torah, the prophets, they would be familiar with what Jesus is talking about. In Numbers chapter 27, on uh, one of the following slides right there, uh, they remember that Yahweh gives breath to all living things. Yahweh will appoint someone over his people to go out, listen to the language, to go out and come in before them. One who will lead them out and bring them in. See the familiarity of that language? So the Lord's people will not be like a sheep without a shepherd. So when Jesus is talking about sheep and shepherd, it's bringing back all these echoes of the Hebrew Bible. Jesus is teaching from a greater whole, a greater whole. His audience would have known about the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah spoke about bad shepherds, shepherds who would destroy and scatter the sheep. In Jeremiah chapter 23, he says, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock. So Yahweh himself will gather the remnant of the flock out of all the countries where I've driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful, increase in number. Again, Ezekiel chapter 34. You see this all over the Hebrew Bible. The God of Israel speaks as the chief shepherd of his people who appoints under shepherds to look after them. Hebrew prophets spoke against temple abuses that were happening through religious leaders. They were using false scales. People would give them money and they would give back less than what they paid for. God himself, Yahweh himself, will come and gather his scattered sheep into one fold from all the distant places they have strayed. Ezekiel chapter 34 says, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. So the Messiah will come from David's line. We know this to be Jesus. Jesus. So if you zoom out of the Bible from 10,000 feet and you look at the big story, you're going to see all these promises in the Hebrew Bible that Yahweh himself will come and save his sheep, gather his flock from back to his pasture. The Hebrew Bible is so rich with shepherd and sheep metaphor, and we have to consider the direct context. This story takes place directly after John chapter 9, where Jesus healed the man born blind. Do you remember that story? Jesus heals this man born blind. He'd been thrown out of the synagogue. He was expelled from the flock by who? Bad shepherds, the Pharisees, right? He was thrown out of the flock by bad shepherds, the Pharisees, who were the shepherds of the synagogue. Remember, the parents were so afraid of these bad shepherds that they didn't even want to testify for their son. They didn't even want to speak for their own kid because they were scared that these bad shepherds would also kick them out. To be kicked out of the synagogue was to be kicked out of community, kicked out of your family. And in chapter 9, remember, the blind man finds a true shepherd, a good shepherd, in Jesus Christ. You see that? That context enriches this story. 
And then verse one, very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep by the gate, a sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The audience would have been familiar with these communal sheep pens, I believe on the next slide. Um, these, oh, the next slide, sorry. Yeah, there we go. Um, these communal sheep pens in Jesus' day, every village would have had one of these sheep pens. Uh, the pic picture a large, sprawling, grassy area. There were hills and stone walls with a single gate as the entrance. And the gatekeeper's job was to ensure that only authorized shepherds would gain access to this area. So if anyone was climbing over the walls uh, of these sheepfolds, then they were thieves. They had malicious intentions right? Only one gate in this large enclosure. Notice that he's addressing the Pharisees. These are bad shepherds. There's this building frustration in Jesus with them. The people who are meant to be leaders, meant to encourage the people of God, meant to care for them and nurture them. They ended up harming them. They were so close-minded within themselves, they were unable to see the truth of this man born blind that had been transformed by Jesus Christ, by his encounter. We see Jesus in the gospel. Remember, he, he, he fashioned a whip out of cords and he'd flip tables in the temple because he was demonstrating what God thought of how these bad shepherds were taking advantage of people. So Jesus is so frustrated. These people who are supposed to bring life to God's people are actually leading them astray. And Jesus calls them thieves and robbers. Verse 2, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So what we might not know about the sheep pens is that a lot of different sheep folds would have entered the same big pen. Remember that picture? There's a lot of room for many shepherds to bring their sheep. And so when, uh, that's why every shepherd that was authorized and the gatekeeper kind of gave, understood they were authorized shepherds, these sheep, uh, these shepherds would come to the gate and they would shout out and by their voice, their particular sheep would come. Isn't that cool? They're all together and every sheep would know their shepherd's voice. The gatekeeper, who we'll see as the father, opens the gate for this shepherd, and the sheep will hear the true shepherd's voice. Sheep were able to distinguish their shepherd's voice amongst others. He calls them by name. He leads them out. He goes before them. The sheep will follow him. Notice the sheep shift in direction. The passage begins with entering the sheepfold, and now the good shepherd is leading them out of that sheepfold. Verse 4, when he has brought out all his own, and this is echoes of the Hebrew Bible, remember Numbers and the prophets, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Remember, Jesus often spoke to those who have ears to hear ears to hear. The Pharisees couldn't understand. Notice the shepherd enters the gate, calls his sheep from the pen, and leads them out. Earlier in this gospel, at the end of chapter 5, on the next slide, Jesus says there's a time coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and call out, uh, come out. So people will hear his voice in the grave, and they will come out of the grave. Regarding this passage, there's a New Testament professor named Andreas Kostenberger, and he says the coming resurrection and judgment is not distant, disconnected, and impersonal event. It's intimately tied to one's relationship with Jesus. There's a relationship with Jesus. There's a responding to Jesus' voice. There's a faith. There's an obedience. There's a love. That's what intimacy looks like. And it's tied in our relationship with him. In chapter 11, the chapter after our passage, Jesus calls out to Lazarus and he comes out of the grave. You remember that? 
Lazarus comes out of the grave. Lazarus recognizes his shepherd's voice and comes out of the grave. The sheepfold is supposed to be a place of protection, but here in the gospel, it's actually equated with death. The sheep will be called out of the fold. Renowned New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce puts it this way, the shepherd is Jesus himself. He is pictured as coming to the Jewish fold and calling his disciples out of it. One of them indeed had just been pushed out. This is the man born blind. Others had come out already, and yet others would come out before long. The members of the religious establishment could not communicate with them. To him, the voice was the, the voice of strangers. But when the true shepherd of Israel found him and spoke to him, he responded to him at once. At the call of his voice, Jesus leads his sheep out of death and into life. You see that? Out of death and into life. Jesus rescues us from sin and death. Jesus rescues us from the grave. Amen? What grave is Jesus calling you out of today? The grave has a voice too, doesn't it? The grave has a voice and tries to call out to us. We know this to be true. Death calls out to us. The grave calls out to us. Voices that are all too common in our story. Voices of shame and guilt. How many of us experience that in our inner monologue? Shame, guilt. Voices that remind us that we're not doing enough, that we're not accomplishing enough, or maybe even that we're not enough, period. Voices of fear, voices of greed, voices of lust, voices of hatred. The grave makes promises to us and we know from experience that the grave doesn't keep them, right? The grave doesn't keep those promises. And yet it keeps calling out to us. Those who follow Jesus are trained to be able to distinguish his voice amongst all those grave voices. My spiritual director, she was reading Matthew chapter 11 to me. And she was reading this passage to me for like an hour. And she was reading it from Eugene Peterson's translation. And one of those uh, verses is where Jesus says, I won't lay anything heavy and ill-fitting on you. I won't lay anything heavy and ill-fitting on you. And I was journaling when she was reading these words to me. And I wrote, the burdens and expectations that other pu others put on me feels heavy and ill-fitting. Have you ever felt that way, that no matter what you do for certain people, it's never enough? No matter what you do for them? And then I wrote, my inner monologue of guilt and shame and cultural baggage is heavy and ill-fitting. My sense of duty to everyone as a pastor every day feels heavy and ill-fitting. My not wanting to disappoint people as a people pleaser it feels heavy and ill-fitting. And this is contrasting with what she was saying from Jesus. Josh, I'm not going to lay anything heavy and ill-fitting on you. And all these grave voices were crying out for my attention. And I've noticed that over the months and over the years, by the power of the Holy Spirit, those grave voices begin to lose their power, don't they? When you start to trust in Jesus Christ, when you read those red letters, you discern his voice. And you start to say, these voices are trying to kill me. The enemy's trying to devour me. Remember the scriptures? And Jesus is giving life to the full, life in abundance. Those vo grave voices will start to grow quieter when we put our trust in Jesus Christ. When we gather in community, just like today, that's why we gather on a rhythm. Because even when we don't feel like it, we come to church to worship, to be reminded of words that give life. Of the voice that is calling us out of the grave. Amen? So even when you don't feel like it, that's when you do it. That's when you do it. When you don't feel like picking up your Bible in the middle of the week, when you're not in community, that's when you do it. When you're feeling tempted by the enemy that wants to ruin all the good progress you've made, that's when you commit yourself to prayer, when you don't feel like it, right? 
The enemy is always crying out. And we are invited to step onto the tracks of oncoming grace. My spiritual director always likens it to what Dallas Willard says. It's like God is this relentless train, and it's grace. We're invited just to step on the tracks, right? And the train's always pursuing us, right? That it's, we get to learn to hear the voice of Jesus, and it's an unconscious formation. The more you learn to listen for it, the more it's natural. And it happens, and you get to... You get to work with God, but my spiritual director is starting to encourage me, Josh, sometimes you get to just watch God. That takes a lot of burden off me as a pastor. So sometimes a stressful email will come in, and I'm like, God, today I'm just going to watch you. (laughs) Because I've tried to do a lot of things in this situation, and today I'm just going to watch you. And then God does it. God does it when I stop trying. Sometimes. Sometimes I have to try. (laughs) But sometimes you can just watch God work. I've been learning to do a little less. And I told my psychotherapist and my spiritual director, I'm tired. She's like, yeah, when you start to slow down, you actually realize how tired you are, right? And it actually takes a lot of effort to keep Sabbath. It's strange, but you have to start exercising those muscles. and Say today, the world doesn't depend on me. The world's being carried by Jesus. It's actually an exercise of faith to keep the Sabbath. And when you do less, suddenly I'm like, I just want to sleep. And God lets you sleep, right? Remember Elijah in the Hebrew Bible? He's so depressed, and God's like, go to bed. And then Elijah wakes up, and he's like, have some food. Go to bed again. And he goes to bed. Have a drink. Go to bed again. That's like a good plan of healing, isn't it? The grave makes promises, and the grave doesn't keep them. We can all speak to that. You know who keeps his promises? Someone say it. (laughs) Right? The shepherd leads them out. The sheep in the fold were protected by walls, right? The sheep in the fold are protected by walls. That's what the walls were there. But when the shepherd leads them out of those walls, then what are they protected by? They don't have walls anymore. But they have the shepherd. They have the shepherd. And the job of the sheep then the only job of the sheep is to stay close to the shepherd. Do you get it? The only job of the sheep is to stay close to the shepherd. They have no walls to protect them, but they have a good shepherd. Eugene Peterson, one of my favorite pastors, he says, quote, Sheep do not recognize any voice but the voice of their own shepherd. There's a chemistry between them. I love that word. There's a chemistry. Each one of us has a chemistry with God a mutual knowing that has developed over time. Jesus knows his own and they know him. End quote. There's a mutual knowing. Isn't that beautiful? For those that have a best friend or a spouse, there's this mutual knowing, right? Happens over time. The sheep's response to the shepherd's voice is a sign of trust and dependence on the shepherd. We're called to trust and depend on Jesus as the shepherd. The goal isn't just to become a sheep. The goal is to be one who hears and follows the voice of the shepherd, the creator of the universe. And we all know that the grave voices are really loud, aren't they? With social media, they get even louder, right? How do you practice to tune into the voice of the shepherd when there's so much going on, when the voice of the grave is so loud? When my wife and I, uh, when we connect at the end of a long day, when we've both been working, uh, oftentimes there's something important we want to say to each other. And then tell me if you recognize these voices. A million voices come in. These are physical voices. Dad, can I have a glass of milk? Dad, I need you to sign this test. Dad, where are my glasses cases? Where's my glasses case? And sometimes I'm like, these are voices I love. These are my kids. And I'm like, shut it, <laughs> right? I'm like, because I'm try- Shelly and I are need- trying to hear each other. And realistically, you can only hear one voice at a time, can't you, right? If you really want to listen, you can only hear one voice at a time. It's why it doesn't work when we're trying to like write a sermon while listening to a podcast or you're trying to like do something, you're trying to be attentive to something while you're doing a task, you end up like blurring out the voice. 
So how do you hear the voice of the shepherd? You have to stop. You have to stop. Maybe you need to read your Bible in this form and not on your phone. Because when that text comes in or that email comes in, guess what? You stop reading. Because you can only hear one voice at a time. Maybe you need to turn off that podcast, turn off Netflix. Because if we want to hear the shepherd's voice, in my experience, you can only hear one voice at a time. One voice. We need space to be attentive. We need space to pray. We need space to meditate. As Pastor John was saying, he's meditating. this morning. We need space to read scripture. We need to ask, is this voice aligning with the good shepherd? Because if it's not, it's, it could be the enemy, right? Does this voice align with the teaching and the character of Jesus Christ? Is it leading me towards love and joy and peace and patience, the fruit of the Spirit? And it's not fruits, plural, it's fruit. It's a singular thing, right? It's a singular whole character that Jesus is building in us. In chapter 20, Jesus says the name Mary, and she responded because she knew the voice. She's like, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. The sheep will know their name. He, the shepherd will call them out by their name. When we respond to his voice or we reject his voice, we're actually rejecting someone. It's not just the scriptures. It's not just the book. It's not just a teaching. It's our good shepherd. It's our good shepherd. Therefore, Jesus says again, verse 7, Truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All, so any false messiah, any bad shepherd, any religious leaders from any time that have come before me, she was, he was saying are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Jesus says twice that he himself is the gate. And there was only one gate in this huge sheepfold. And there was a gatekeeper. And the gate in the Old Testament was a place of protection. The gate was a fortification. It was defense. Justice would be held outside the town gate. This is the imagery that the Old Testament paints about the gate. And at the end of the scripture in Revelation, it says the gates of the new Jerusalem, the new city, are never shut. The gates of the new city are never shut. You know why? Because there's no more danger because we are in the eternal presence. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's no more danger and our job will be stay close to the shepherd. And our job through life today, stay close to the shepherd. Jesus is the gate. Whoever enters through him will be saved. How does it make sense that Jesus is the gate and the shepherd? Well, in the scriptures it says the good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep, right? The shepherd himself is the gate, but the good shepherd enters the sheepfold and through laying down of his life on the basis of his death and resurrection, Jesus calls us out of the grave. He defeats sin and death. It's not a sacrificial system of the temple that saves us. It's not five pillars. It's not eightfold paths. There's no way we can earn our relationship with a holy God it's provided for us through no assistance of our own. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid the price. He was crucified for our sins. His blood was shed and it covers over, it atones. It covers our sins. Tom Wright, one of my favorite New Testament scholars says, Jesus is the gate to life with God, but he's also the shepherd who leads us into that life. He's the gate and he leads us through the gate, right? It's through relationship with Jesus himself that frees us from the power of sin and death. So we're not only saved from the penalty of sin and death, we're saved from the power of sin and death. So we're being saved by those grave voices, like from those grave voices. We're being saved by Jesus from those voices. And eventually we'll be saved from the presence of sin. Saved from the penalty of sin, saved by the, being saved by the power of sin, we'll be saved from the presence of sin. That's the gospel. And verse 10, the thief comes in only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and life to the full. So the way to true life is not through the doors of achievement like the world teaches us. 
you're ever on Instagram, every reel is like hustle, 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 grind, grind, grind. This is how I made billion dollars in four days, right? Religiosity, it's not through that door either. It's not through wealth or accumulation. It's through a person, it's through Jesus Christ, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth isn't a philosophy then. Truth is a person. The way is a person. And life is a person. Jesus Christ. The abundant life is life as God lives it. It's life lived beyond the limitations of our natural self. When those grave voices are too powerful for our natural self, who can we depend on? Someone beyond ourself. Jesus Christ. We can draw on God's resources in meeting the challenges we face. The life that Jesus offers is a life that starts today. It says eternal life. And sometimes we see eternal as something future. Eternal is now and future. The life Jesus invites us to starts now. It's not, well, I'll just wait till I pass away and I'm in heaven. It's life today. It's life today to the full, right? It doesn't end. It's a life that doesn't perish a life so rich that it's actually a tragedy if you live anything less than that, right? C.S. Lewis often talks about like a kid playing with mud pies in a mud pit, and there's an endless ocean oasis right in front of them. That's the offer that Jesus offers us in the here and now. And sometimes we can be so blind and enjoy life in the mud pit, right? Or not enjoy, (laughs) languish in that mud pit life when life eternal is right there. So some questions just to reflect upon. Am I settling for anything less than life to the full that's offered by Jesus? Am I settling? The word settle is not a great word, right? (laughs) Am I settling for a mud pit life? Am I holding on to things that prevent me from fully embracing the abundant life that Jesus offers? Some things that prevent us from accept receiving that life are those grave voices. Those grave voices that accuse us, that beat us up, that try to pull us and devour us. Who or what are those voices that I'm listening to in my life? What are the podcasts I listen to? What are the books that I read? What are the voices I watch on YouTube? Are they the voice of Jesus or are they a grave voice? How do I listen to the voice of Jesus amidst the noise and distractions? Is this voice guiding me to greater love and joy and peace and faithfulness and kindness? Does it align with who Jesus is? In what ways can my voice be a voice that brings life to other people, right? And influence and guide people to this good shepherd. We heard uh, Karen's praise item where she got to pray with somebody. Her voice is a voice that brings life to others. Unlike internet meme Karens, right? Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal if there's anything preventing us from greater relational intimacy with Jesus. Do I embody the love and compassion of the good shepherd? How do I love the people around me? Jesus invites us to life in the full. And our job, our only job is to stay close to the shepherd. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Let's pray. Holy Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we thank you for the gift of your word. Your word is like a lamp to our feet. Your word leads to life. It guides us. And so, Holy Spirit, would you bring the truth of the scripture that we engaged with today to home in our hearts, that we would be still and learn to discern the voice of the good shepherd. Holy Spirit, help us resist the evil one, Help us resist the evil one so that he will flee and we draw close to God as the scripture promises. Help us resist those grave voices and to discern with ever increasing clarity your voice in our lives, especially when those grave voices get loud. Holy Spirit, help us. And we know that the God who calls us to this is faithful and he will do it. Help us yield to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.